Um, thank you very much, uh, Luis and Marcellis, for the introduction. I'm happy to be with you guys uh, today. Um, we will discuss uh, this morning how we can face online harassment. As we all know, uh, online harassment is a new front, front that is open for journalists. And we will discuss what we can do about it. Okay, um, as, a, as a small icebreaker, I will launch um, some questions that will show up on your screen. So if you could please help me out to answer those questions. So we better know um, what's going on with you guys. Okay, so I will launch the the icebreaker questions now. You, so you will see four questions. The first one is, have you experienced some form of online violence in connection to your work? It's just a yes or no answer. There is another question that says, what is the most frequent topic you cover? Uh, there you will select all options that apply. Then we have another question that says, do you currently have a support network to counter online abuse? And then we have a last question that says, uh, select the kind of support you consider relevant to fight online harassment. So with this, you will help us out to better know you. And this will also help me out to give you uh, useful examples for the topics that we will be discussing today. Thank you for answering. Keep the questions and uh, sorry, keep the answers coming. All right. I am looking at some interesting statistics here. Okay. I will share the results of the of the poll in, in in a minute or two. I'm just waiting for some more answers to come. All right, keep them coming, guys. We still have um, maybe five participants that we would love to have their answers to these questions. So go ahead and check them out. I think we can close the poll right now. We have a fair amount of answers right now. Okay, great. So let's see. Uh, I'm going to end the poll, and then we will be all able to see the answers to the questions that, that I just posted, okay? So I'm ending the poll. Now I am sharing the results. Okay, so check this out. Uh, pretty much the first question is a 50% yes and no. So half of you guys have actually experienced some form of online abuse in connection to your work. Um, it's actually, um, I mean, it's not nice to be uh, to be subject of online violence. But the good news is that we we will see today some some actions you can take to fight that. Uh, I'm actually glad that half of you haven't yet experienced any form of online abuse. That's great news. Uh, the second question is, what is the most frequent topic you cover? So most of you guys are into human rights and gender issues, followed by politics, uh, then other topics, and then corruption. And we have so, only some participants covering the military and organized crime uh, subjects. So, all right. That, that gives me an idea about what you guys are into. Great. OK. so. The, the other question, do you currently have a support network to counter online abuse? Okay, so this is pretty pretty interesting. 71% of you guys do not have any kind of support network. And this is something we will, we hope you guys start doing. We'll give you some tips. You can, you can follow to grow, I mean, to create a support network. And if you have one to grow it. So we, there's an area of, of, of opportunity here. 
And then the last question, select the kind of support you consider relevant to fight online harassment. Yeah, of course, digital security comes first. Thanks for that. <laughs> and then, yeah, you, you guys are so right, mental health. Yeah, digital security impacts mental health a lot. And we, we professionals in cybersecurity have just beginning to recognize the impact of mental health. I think this coronavirus pandemic switched everyone's attention to mental health. So I'm, I'm glad that this topic is being raised by you guys. Then uh, the other option we have, it's legal support, which I agree it's actually very much needed. And yeah, physical security. Of course, online uh, harassment sometimes crosses the screen and becomes visible. So yeah, that's a very important topic here. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to stop sharing the results and we will go ahead and start with the presentation. So again, if you have any questions, we would love to hear them and you can use the Q&A uh, button on Zoom. So you please uh, type down your questions there. I will actually pick them up as, as they are coming or at the end, we will have some minutes to discuss any questions you might have and I'll do my best to answer all those questions. If not, uh, we can get back to you with, with some more precise answers, okay? All right, so let's go. We have four topics for today. First topic is facing bots and trolls. So we will discuss those terms minutes. So if you're not familiar with what a bot, what a troll is, don't worry, we will cover it. Second topic is preventing doxing, which is basically uh, preventing someone from exposing your private information online. So you can be subject of online harassment from others. All right. And then third topic is what to do before defamation campaigns. So we, we try not to be only uh, reactive, but also preventive. So there are actually some, a lot of things that we can do before any defamation campaigns uh, come to us. I mean, hopefully that's not the case, but if, if they do, we, we should be prepared, okay? Then uh, we have the fourth topic is countering online harassment best practices, okay? Great, so let's start. Facing bots and trolls. Um, let me, let me explain to you why I'm actually selecting this as the first topic in today's call. Uh, in late 2020, uh, UNESCO and ICFJ conducted a global survey about online violence against women journalists. And here is the link uh, of this um, global survey. I will actually drop the link to the survey in the chat so you can check it out. Um, I am sharing uh, just some few findings. Okay, there you go. The, the link to the, to the survey is on the chat right now. Okay, so um, here are some interesting findings. According to the survey, 57 of online violence directed at women included unknown or anonymous people as a source. So of course, uh, aggressors are not showing their face. They are uh, hiding behind fake identities, fake accounts, or just random people that, um, that the victim doesn't know. Okay, so 57%, that's a huge number. That's why we are actually starting today's discussions with bots and trolls, because that 57% compromise is actually, I think, both. Then 37% of of the of the of the women that were interviewed, identified political actors as the, as the perpetrators. So I would like you two guys to think about um, the topics that you cover, and this statistic saying that thirty percent of aggressions came from political actors. So this can be on a state level or on a federal level, with access to very expensive tools. Uh, to spy on journalists or maybe just some bot networks to to attack people online, etc. So this is interesting, um, I think. So the third, um, the second finding of, of the survey that I liked a lot was that the following top three threats 
uh, were experienced. First, of course, abuse with hateful language, then harassment with unwanted private messages, and then targeted reputational threats. And you know what? Uh, I mean, this is not nice at all, not nice whatsoever, but keep in mind that uh, social media nowadays, uh, I mean, platforms have artificial intelligence algorithms to detect hate speech. So the first, uh, the first type of online threat will be actually kind of taken care of by the by the automated algorithms built into Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so on. Of course, algorithms are not perfect, and of course, they are still in development. Um, I'm sure the best algorithms uh, would be in English, but uh, as we all know, uh, it's not everyone's. Um, main language so algorithms are actually being improved as, as, as we speak in so many different languages so this is being taken care of by by the um, by the online platforms somewhat then the second type of online threat can be somewhat controlled by ourselves with uh, with our privacy and security settings because as as you know we can actually um restrict who can send us uh, private messages. So, so we don't get a notification or if they send a picture, it's actually blurred. We have to click it and confirm to be able to see the picture, etc. So there is actually something to be done about, uh, about unwanted private messages. Of course, uh, some will open the messages um, and will. And the third type of online violence uh, faced by a woman was targeted reputational threats. And I think this is, um, this is, in my opinion, the most severe kind of attack because it, it goes like against your psychological well-being. And that's, I mean, you, you cannot change that with the, with the security settings in the computer. So that's, that's like your own psychological uh, side. So there's nothing you can do on a computer to, to change that. So that has to be worked on on an individual basis. Okay, so, all right. So let's go ahead now with uh, with short definitions, just in case you guys are not aware of all these terms. Sometimes I get asked about what's the difference between a bot and a troll. So we will go over that real quick. A bot is just an autonomous or semi-autonomous computer program used to simulate behavior on the internet, period. Um, in this context, of course, we are talking about social media bots, but of course there are bots to uh, make automated purchases on the internet, bots to provide customer service, etc. Um, usually, bots are sold online. Um, they come pre-packed. So, uh, if if you want to have access to a bot, I mean, I'm I'm not saying for for malicious purposes. Just general generally speaking, you can get the bot. It comes pre-packed. You can change just some settings here and there, and boom, it works. Or you can be you can be paying someone. To have access to that bot network, and right here is where state actors um, come because they sometimes they they don't have the knowledge to operate bot networks to attack people, so they just go ahead and rent the service to to programmers that are actually taking money uh, doing doing bad stuff. So um, if you if you think that your government is not that smart to operate a bot network, you might be right but they can still pay someone else to operate that bot network for them. So there's that. Now, as I said, not, not all bots are malicious. Some are used to uh, deliver news, traffic, and weather reports. They can even interact with you as customer service reps, uh, et cetera. So, I mean, not all, not all bots are bad, okay? Now, um, what, matter is, what matters is harassment campaigns on social media would use bots to artificially increase the volume of harmful content. So let's say you start covering a certain topic, um, people in power doesn't like you, they start actually, uh, I mean, you see suddenly um, a massive amount of messages with low quality content or harmful content or online violence. That doesn't mean there's a lot of people angry at, at you. It just means that maybe there's a bot network and like like a farm of programming mean, for farm of fake identities controlled by a central uh, station just delivering bad 
interactions against you. So uh, keep that in mind because that doesn't mean that a lot of people uh, doesn't like what you what you wrote. It's just that there are reasons on tools to um, to go against you. And of course, um, bots are also used to decrease or increase exposure of certain trending topics. So let's say um, let's say that you wrote a super nice investigative journalism piece. Uh, you put it online, and then people start um, like trying to to lower the visibility of your of your journalistic uh, investigation. Maybe they can they can start uh, putting some related content that is actually uh, putting your investigation uh, under dirt. So not only bots are used to to attack people. They are also used to decrease exposure of, of a trending topic that doesn't that the owner of the bot network doesn't like. Okay. Now, uh, keep in mind that social media bots can like and share posts. So this way, uh, they can um, they can like use the, the uh, social media just social media algorithms to increase the increase exposure of certain photos or posts. They can also upload pictures. They can follow each other. So if, if you see uh, an account that it's uh, that it's having some some that is exhibiting some violent behavior and you see it has a lot of followers, chances are most of them are fake. Okay, and the newest the newest bots are actually able to create their own content using artificial intelligence algorithms. They can even type. So there's no need to have someone on the back like typing what they want the bot to say. Like bots are now so smart that they can create their own content. So that's that's amazing. I mean, technology is always a double-edged sword. So it can be used against against people or for people. And well, uh, last but not least, social bots are seeking to manipulate public opinion, of course, to run and ruin discussions. So, okay, enough about definitions. I want to show you what a bot looks like because um, a lot of, most of the times when we people in the technology um, side of things, when we talk about um, this kind of stuff, like people, people has a hard time Im imagining what the thing looks like for real. So this is actually a tweet bot. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if you can purchase this or, or if it's free, but anyways, here you can see that you can program this, this software to publish a certain amount of tweets or to reply to another tweet, or you can uh, set it up to retweet, to favorite, uh, and tweet or to follow people. So as you can see, you can just fill this out, automate it, one click, and boom, then you have an account that has an increased follower account, or maybe uh, a, a person um, just puts an online hate tweet, then they use these kind of tools to reproduce this, the message everywhere. So this is what uh, bad people use to harass uh, other journalists. And again, uh, this, is a, this is another screen where you can select the target of a spam campaign. So go figure, this is possible. And these, these kind of programs are not even expensive at all. So really uh, these kind of attacks are so common because they are somewhat easy to carry. Okay, well, uh, that's it for bots. Now we will go and talk about trolls. What makes a troll different from a bot is that the troll is actually a person. There is a person behind every account there are just people that, that like to provoke others, create conflict or controversy. That's it. Uh, they are not necessarily state-sponsored accounts, although they can be kind of sympathizers, etc. But uh, usually, when there are defamation campaigns, trolls and bots work together, and they they seem like unstoppable. But somehow, we we do have some tools at least to minimize the impact that these kind of campaigns can have on themselves. So um, of course, this is easier said than done. But if, if you have the guts, you can just 
ignore them. I mean, you cannot stop an online farm of 1,000 accounts uh, publishing some um, offensive content. <laughs> Just ignore them, that's it. Um, you can block offenders. This, this might not be a, a so useful if you have a bunch of accounts, but if you have like one, two, maybe five accounts of trolls turning you, you can just block them, boom, that's it. Or you can even set up your social media profile to filter certain words. Remember that on a, on a, on a previous slide, I showed you that one of the most common attacks was, uh, was just using violent, violent words against people. Well, you can just uh, go one step, uh, one step ahead and filter certain words. So if you're getting a bunch of insults and so on, just go ahead and put them on, on a blacklist in every interaction or every comment or every, yeah, I mean, every message containing certain specific words, you're just gonna go straight to the trash. So th that, that's filtered like, like filters on emails or, or, or Excel. You filter something out, boom, forget about it. And um, I mean, that's pretty effective, right? And of course, you can, you do have the options to report comments and profiles. Some of you might think, well, what for? Uh, it's not useful. They're not going to stop those profiles. But you know what? Um, as I told you, um, artificial intelligence detection algorithms are enriched by people. So the more you, you flag uh, abusive content, the smarter the algorithm uh, is. So with the time, uh, algorithms are gonna become super, super accurate. Um, here, uh, I have, oh, sorry. I have four, four tools here that will help you to analyze Twitter accounts and Twitter trends. Uh, I do have uh, a small, uh, a small, um, I mean, I will share with you my screen to show you how, how uh, these all work. But I think I will show it at the end because you guys will have a lot of questions regarding the following tools. So I prefer to set that aside in the meanwhile and continue with the rest of the topics. And then I will go back to these four tools, but just to give you guys, um, um, to give you guys um, what we will, we will cover, Bodometer. It's a tool to detect if, if an account is a bot or not a bot. So these will analyze follower account, how many tweets they have, what time of the day they, they publish certain tweets. Uh, this will also analyze um, some statistical patterns. Okay, The other tool right here, Bot Sentinel, will actually tell, this will not tell you if someone is it's a bot or not. This will tell you if the owner of that Twitter account is a disruptive user or not. So it has a scale. Uh, it's, I mean, it's not from one to five, but it, it, it does have like five levels. So you can actually search for a specific Twitter account and see if that user is, it's, uh, it's used to post harmful content. So, so you know in advance who you are dealing with. Then we have uh, hashtagify, which will analyze Twitter trends when they were created, where the tweets are coming from, which Twitter accounts with the most exposure are using the, the trending topics, uh, how popular uh, the trending topic is uh, against uh, against time, etc. And then, and then you have Google Trends, which will, will give you some insights about. Uh, where the people using certain terms are is coming from. Um, you can kind of use a combination of these tools to try to understand where an attack is coming from, if that helps. I think it is very important for us to, to know our enemy. And these tools are not exactly meant to fight um, trolls and bots. Uh, like that, they are just useful to give you an idea of where those accounts are coming from or what they want. So, yeah, again, um, if you have any questions so far, feel free to put them on the Q&A uh, section of Zoom. 
we will we will go over your questions at the end of the call. Okay. Then okay, let's jump to the to the second topic, uh, preventing doxing. Um, I would like to give you an example about uh, a, a local case of doxing that that occurred in Mexico. I know most of you guys are from Asia, but this this was a local example I can somehow relate to. There were um, some opposition politicians that were not agree with a decision made by the local government. And somehow someone was uh, was able to find the, the home address of, of this couple. So then they were intimidated because they were they were just random guys like surrounding their house. So <laughs> they actually, of course, they, they made up um, they took that, uh, I mean, they took legal action, but but they still felt harassed. I mean, even if you take legal action, you cannot, I mean, that alone cannot stop you from feeling bad about it. Okay, so what we want here is preventing someone from finding out maybe a full name, where we live, what our private email address is, what her cell phone is, what we like to to maybe to eat even because that can give a clue of where uh, what restaurants we visit um, or schedule. Uh, we want to prevent people from knowing where we go, etc. So um, the the let I mean that the magnitude of the private information that you are unknowingly sharing is huge. You will actually surprise yourself. If you knew that many, I mean, the number of companies that have somehow a private set of information that relates to you, it's huge. That's even a, an industry. Like there are companies that purchase uh, segments of information that maybe maybe it has phone numbers, ages, um, an estimate of income, etc. Uh, may, um, maybe interests. Uh, it's mainly used for advertisement, but it can also be used for, for malicious purposes. So, well, let's start. Uh, what is doxing is, well, it's basically collecting information about someone from various sources to expose it online with intention to cause public embarrassment and incite others to take part in hostilities. So this is like uh, outsourcing and, and aggression. So you don't want to do it yourself because you don't want to face the consequences of harming others. So what do we do? What you do, you actually publish information about someone and let others take care of the aggression itself. So of course, people participating in hostilities, maybe they have no clue that they are kind of being manipulated. But I mean, it happens, okay? So what can you do about it? First of all, um, sometimes, or we ourselves are the ones rebuilding information on ourselves. So, well, first of all, review your social media privacy settings. We, we spoke about this on the previous uh, session, but to reiterate, super important to no one have control of what you share. You should have absolute control and knowledge about what you are showing others. And also keep in mind that uh, your social media privacy settings are working for both your people, you know, for your contacts and people that don't have you as a friend or, or as a follower. So make sure to set up different privacy settings for both audiences. Maybe you, you will share some aspects of your personal life with your friends, but you don't want to show that to, to the public, to the open public, to the open internet. So make sure you do do that first, that way you, you stop someone from acquiring intelligence about you. Of course, second topic is limit what you share about yourself online. I mean, I know guys, I mean, it, it's hard sometimes not to share something about your life because I mean, we, we are all social beings. We like interaction, we like attention, but there has to be a limit when our security uh, is, could be affected. Right, so uh, I mean, maybe it's not a good idea to share that you are on vacations because people know that your house is empty. So if they wanna uh, break in and 
take a, take your computer or your hard drive or search what documents you have. I mean, that could be a consequence of telling people that you are thousands of kilometers away from home. So just watch out. Um, third, third bullet point, clean up your own all social media posts. I mean, we have been owning social media profiles for um, some of us for more than 10 years. And of course, 10 years ago, maybe, I mean, uh, I was into social, into cybersecurity, of course, but maybe I didn't imagine I was, I was going to train people. So, right. So maybe I have some old social media posts that I wouldn't like people to see. Maybe it's so personal or it's related about, uh, I mean, I don't know, personal relationship I had, et cetera, habits, whatever. So when, when you have uh, photos or a post that you created 13, 15 years ago, I mean, you, you have to go back and somewhat clean that, clean, clean that stuff. Do you want that to backfire and affect your, your reputation or your professional standing or whatnot? So then you have, you do have, believe it or not, the option to ask Google to remove personal information. Most of you guys, uh, I know that didn't know this even this option even exists, but yes, you can actually ask Google to remove information about you. They have a bunch of products, Google search, Google images, Google calendar, Gmail, many, many apps. You can tell them, you know what? I don't want you guys to keep my birthday info or my name, etc. So yeah. Okay, another bullet point of we talk about this the other day, do not reuse passwords. As a quick recap, what happens if your password somehow is exposed on the open internet, someone can try to use that same password on a different platform. Let's say, uh, just an example, your Spotify password was leaked, was exposed online. Someone can try to, to use that password to log into the Gmail account and boom, they have access to your contacts, your Google Drive, their Google Photos, well, and I'm, that, that becomes a tragedy. So please do not reuse passwords. Then uh, please use different names across websites, different usernames. Why this is important? Because if you, if you go ahead and do a Google search, use the any username you might have used in the past, then you might find that you use that username on a variety of websites that, that are maybe not related to your professional life, but that will give others intelligence about what you like, what you read, what you purchase, what are your hobbies, et cetera. So the less information you give others, the better. And if you have different usernames across websites, then if someone searches for a specific username, there is no correlation between other websites. So you cannot break uh, stuff into pieces, make them, making them harder for any actor to gather those pieces and create the complete picture. Okay. Second, uh, third one, if you have a website, if you want a website, uh, uh, maybe a blog, or if you run uh, a media a media website, a newspaper, a magazine, etc., use domain privacy when you register your domain, because this will hide the owner of the domain, the phone number, the address because you do have to provide all that info when you register for the main for the main page. At the main, uh, it's basically um, the address of, of your website. Let's say it's for for example taiwannews.com. So when you register taiwannews.com, you have to give the um, the registrant your name, address, phone number, etc. And if you don't use the main privacy, then that information is exposed to anyone when they register. Uh, the domain, believe it or not, domain privacy uh, sometimes backfired for people doing, uh, I mean, involving corruption. When they create uh, fake companies or whatnot, they forget to use domain privacy, and then you can see who's behind certain website, 
So it's funny because sometimes you can catch the bad guys because they didn't use domain privacy. So again, it can be good or a bad thing depending who you are. So well, uh, another uh, another tip: uh, mask your location using a VPN. Uh, a VPN it's basically a software that will mask your real location. When you, when you visit any website, the owner of the website knows the, your IP address, which is a, uni a unique network identifier. Each computer on the world has a, has a unique IP. So with that IP address, you can, you can reverse it. And you can find out who is the provider of your internet service, uh, what country are you from, and even um, sometimes even what city you, you're in. So if you are concerned about uh, harmful actor knowing where you are located, if you visit some websites that they control, you can use a VPN. And sometimes uh, I have seen attacks where, uh, where attackers send journalist emails, say, say whatever stuff. I mean, it, it, that's not the point. The point is that that email has uh, has a, a super small image, a one pixel image, we call it. So when you open the email, you download this invisible image and you reveal your IP address or cellular location. So that's why we always tell people do not open emails of people you don't know, because if that email has uh, a one pixel image, when you download it from other servers, they will know where you are. Uh, fortunately, most email providers now are disallowing the downloads of images if you have not received emails from certain address. So uh, I know Gmail for a fact doesn't download images automatically from emails, but some providers still do. So that's why uh, it is important for you to use VPN if by any chance you receive an email like this and you download this invisible uh, image, then you are not revealing your IP address. Um, another option is, and this uh, this might seem um, complicated, but it's not that hard. Remove uh, remove metadata from photos and files. I we have a question here. Let's see. Okay, and an attendee, how do you set up uh, the VPN? Is it free? Do you set it up once and you are all done, or you need to refresh it every time you, you log on? Thank you. All right, here you go. Yes, they are free VPN services. I will actually share some links on the chat. Okay, so, okay, that's one. Problem VPN dot com this is actually one of my favorite services because it's oh, number one it's free it's run by people that are trusted in the in the security industry and it's free and it's available for your windows computer for your mac computer for your android device and for linux so you can use uh from vpn there's another um Another service I like a lot. Let me share the address with you guys. Okay, this is another service I like. This one uh, has a cost. I mean, it's not that much, but you do have to pay for it. What I like a lot about the second provider is that it's kind of faster than the, than the first one. And you, you can select um, a huge number of nodes. Now, regarding the, the, the other portions of your question, do you set it up once and you were all done? Well, kind of, uh, because it's a program that you install on your phone or on your computer, and you, you do have to hit connect so the VPN can be activated uh, unless you select it to, to, to launch and connect every time uh, but it's recommended that you that you manually switch it on because sometimes it can interfere. Uh, I mean, if you are logging into your bank account or email, sometimes you can think that you are an attacker because you are logging on from elsewhere. So, yeah. Okay. 
Um, I hope that answers your question. If not, we can discuss this further at the end of the call. Okay. Uh, then we have this other bullet point here. Have a separate email account to sign up for website. I mean, to websites that can be used to track your habits or interests. This goes hand in hand with the other tip that you should use different usernames. This is the same the same stuff. If you are setting up for a service that you might only use once, I mean, do not use your work email account because that can link. Uh, they can link you to the other service. And if the other service is attacked, then your website will give information about who you are. So you don't want that. And third, try not to link your Google and Facebook account to third party services. Uh, this might be an unpopular tip, but let me explain to you the reasoning behind this. It's super easy. To, to sign up for our website using your Google and your Facebook account, so convenient. You don't have to remember another username, another password. Uh, and both Google and Facebook do have controls about who, who is actually allowed to use their, their API. It's a programming term, but who can use their, their software to connect their account to third party services to allow someone to use any platform. But the problem comes when uh, these companies are sold to somebody else, when they changed hands, when they change jurisdictions. Uh, for instance, maybe we have an American company that it's then later on acquired by a Chinese uh, uh, conglomerate. Maybe they don't have the same, the same um, I don't know, ethics. Or maybe the provider can get hacked, why not? So um, if, you, if you do not use your Facebook or Google account to log into third-party services, you are shielded somehow for, from, from that uh, scenario. It might be not so quite common, but I mean, it can happen. Okay. Then, okay. Yeah, for at least personally, please burn this VPN. Yeah, I love it too. The, the basic search is free. That's true. Okay. Um, thank you, Virgin Luis. I do like Proton VPN too. Um, besides, the, the people behind Proton VPN, they're so smart, but really so smart. Um, the guy behind Proton, uh, I believe he's a scientist that that is uh, somehow related to this particle accelerator. So. Wow, I mean, so what a, what a smart person behind this. So yeah, I admire him. Okay, so third point, what to do before defamation campaigns? Before, all right, so let's go ahead. Uh, we spoke about this uh, the other day, but again, and make sure to enable multi-factor or two-factor authentication and review your password security. Why you must be doing this before a defamation campaign? Because if suddenly you are in the middle of a defamation campaign, there's going to be a lot of people, a lot of people trying to break into your accounts. So if by any chance these defamation campaigns happens early in the morning or at night and you're not even awake, then yeah, then I mean you wake up and you no longer have access to your account. So make sure you do that before, before. And if you think you are, you might be a victim of a defamation campaign. I mean, this is one of the first actions you should take. Enable two-factor authentication and review your password security. So again, another tip that it's kind of similar to what I told you about before, do not overshare or expose personal information on social media. This can be used against you. And this third topic, it's important because the, um, the survey gave me some insights about um, most of you do not have any support networks. Let's define what a support network is first. A support network consists of professionals that can help you out in a situation like, in a, in a difficult situation like a defamation campaign or a cyber attack. There are a lot of, of 
professionals in, in the IT industry that are doing um, volunteer work with journalists. They are a bunch of non-profit organizations, of course, the Border Center and ICFJ included, that can, if not help you directly, they can, they can tell you who, who you can go to to get help. And this help can consist, of course, of maybe cybersecurity training, digital forensics, uh, legal counseling, um, maybe emotional support. So, I mean, there are a lot of resources. Uh, make sure to see which ones uh, are applicable to your location or to your language, because you can actually get support. You are not alone. Just rem remember that you are not alone when you are subject of a defamation campaign or a cyber attack. There is a lot of people like me that can help you out. So make sure to start building that support network over time. Hopefully you won't you won't be using that, but just in case you have their back. Um, okay, another bullet point here, have a plan to prevent and deal with online harassment. That includes roles, responsibilities, and counter speech strategies. Um, what this means is, for instance, if you have a, an IT guy that is super smart that can help you out with uh, to maybe to recover your email account if, if it was taken over with someone, just make sure that that person is, uh, that you have his or her phone number or email or that he will respond to your call or to your email if you mention certain things on the subject, et cetera. Define who's responsible for what. If, for, for instance, if you are working on a, on a media outlet and then uh, you are under trouble, make sure to the legal department is engaged make sure uh, your editor or, or the president of the company uh, takes, takes some action. Maybe he can reach some people, et cetera. Maybe, maybe someone can call authorities and, or take legal action. Maybe you can, uh, you can uh, think about a counter speed strategy, like uh, what to say if they start messing with you on a certain topic that you think they can use? I mean, I, I don't know if, if, if they, if they, if you think they can say, oh, you know what, this person is, is an alcoholic or this person is, uh, is uh, has no value because he mistreats animals or whatever. And of course that isn't true, uh, but it helps if you have a speech to give in case something happens. I mean, it's, it's better to prevent, right? Than to react. Okay, now um, for topic, again, if you have questions, um, feel free to put them on, on the Q&A section. Uh, or maybe at the end, we can, have a, we can have a discussion on the chat, why not? All right, so countering online harassment the best practices. This is actually a very interesting part of the call. Okay, so let's say, and now the bad scenario came to life. Now you were under uh, under uh, online harassment campaign. Well, of course you will engage your support network. You you will make some phone calls. You will send us some emails. You will implement the collective counter speech strategy. You are not alone. Remember that's one important thing. You are not alone, and the fact that you know that there's people um, on your back. I mean, there's people. Uh, Supporting you will help to your mental stability and mental health. So just, just the notion that you are supported by a group of people will help you to deal uh, with this kind of situations. So pretty important, document any interactions and data that can later serve as an evidence. I've seen people that just delete the messages. They don't want them on their inbox, they delete the messages. And then if a legal action is actually carried out, you need to have some evidence to present. All right, so uh, you have to document which user sent the message at what time, what the message said, and maybe, maybe if authorities work the way they are supposed to work and a cyber, an official cyber criminal investigation is launched, maybe they can 
they can go against the perpetrators. So make sure at least not to delete any in any messages sent to your inbox or, or whatever that can later serve as an evidence. Okay. Then, um, of course, if you are now under this harassment campaign, I mean, it's not late to harden your security settings even more. So uh, you can restrict who is sending you private messages. And you can also report online violence using social media uh, built-in mechanisms. So as I told you, this can help the abuse detection algorithms uh, be better. Okay, so you can also uh, report the online harassment to your employer. This is for me a very important topic because the, your employer has to know that your journalistic duties somehow are being used against you and they are somehow responsible for your overall well-being. I think there's still work to do um, on, on the employer's side to recognize that what, what that the assignments to journalists can have an effect on, on, on health. And then of course you can seek legal and psychological counseling if, if you think it's necessary. And well, last but not least, if you run a media organization, uh, you can offer friendly mechanisms and policies to for others to report uh, harassment, either coming from your teammates or coming from the outside and please act in a timely manner. Okay, man, well, if you are, uh, you can consider developing a an, an holistic approach. And we have reached the end of, of, the, of the session. Um, I think I took the whole hour. I'm not sure if, if we have uh, room for, for a couple of questions, if any. Or if you guys feel like it, we can just wrap up. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, uh... Jorge Sebastian, I think our time is 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 up. We could uh, we could actually get uh, uh, questions via email as well throughout the coming weeks, coming days as well. My colleague Alex Susana has just posted the email uh, Asia Security Program at ICE that all will be able to answer some of your questions. Uh, it has been a, a pleasure. Uh, having you all in today's webinar. Thank you, Jorge Sebastián, for a terrific uh, presentation.